Fit toward the top, and Adam Johnson picked up the phone, and we connected, and uh, and he said, "Hey, we're gonna um, we should connect sometime. I want to come down to your meetup. He has a meetup in Hattiesburg, and he said, "Hey, y'all, uh, let's let's you know connect sometime." A lot of you guys know Adam, um, so Adam and I started getting to know each other, and then he said, "You're gonna love my dad." Mm. And uh, the first time I ever met Adam in person was at a crawfish boil at Leon's house. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I was the first one there and the last one to leave. Um, and I kid you not, I think it went for eight to 10 hours. It was like an all day thing. And, uh, but Leon that day um, was so excited to talk to me just about real estate. He lights up when he talks about real estate. And he goes, what are you doing tomorrow? And I was like, I don't know, what am I doing? <laughs> like, I have a feeling you're gonna tell me what I'm doing. He said, well, I'm doing a lease up with a tenant at my house tomorrow, do you wanna come back? Well, Leon's all the way in Wiggins, Mississippi, and you know, now we're away from here. Come on, come on down, uh, young man. And he said, hey, I'm doing a lease up with a tenant tomorrow, do you wanna come hear me do this lease up? And I was like, absolutely. I had to walk to the end of your driveway to call some people to clear my schedule the next day. Because um, he doesn't have cell service at his house. Uh, it's not the greatest. Wi-Fi, really. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> but it was one of those things, I immediately re um, resonated with him that I said, he's doing real estate the way I want to do real estate. Um, up until that point, I was doing a, um, a good fair amount of deals, but I was learning from a lot of new school guys who, you know, let's chase 100 plus deals a year, Let's, you know, da, da, da. and I'm like, so I was doing that, but I felt like I was keeping up with the real estate Joneses. And when I met Leon, um, he opened my eyes to a different way of doing real estate. So Leon, you've been investing since 1975. Mm -hmm. um, so you're 21 years old. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Okay. Almost 21. <laughs> Almost 21. Yeah. Um, so Leon, um, has had a very long career in real estate investing. Still a very active, look, we went out to di um, dinner before this and he was taking phone calls for deals. So I'm like, I'm like, excuse me, sir. Um, how, like, he, he's like, well, I got, I, his phone was ringing every two minutes. Well, hold on, we're working some deals right now. I gotta make sure. <laughs> no, um, and so with that, we have compiled a list of questions. So my thought here is, I want to interview him to pull as much information out of him that so I can for you guys to kind of hear some of his wisdom. Um, so I'm going to encourage you, if you do not have something to take notes on, pull out your phone. Because Leon is a sniper with these wisdom mm -hmm. little gems that he drops. He'll be telling a story. Amen. And then by the end of it, you're like, did he just say, or it's, so he's going to tell stories but understand that the principles in those stories are really important to, to listen to, okay? And then what I'll do is, um, are you okay if we go through these, try to get through these 10 questions and hold questions toward the end? You guys cool with that? 
Sometimes I get through two of them. Wait, he's good at telling great jokes, too. He'll yeah, pull you in and pull you. So he is going to tell jokes, and his signature move is? Okay. That's Adam. No. No, that's, that's you. you. Um, so Leon. Leon's predominantly, a lot of you guys know, predominantly he's a, he's a creative real estate investor, but predominantly a buy and hold investor with, with rentals. We're going to talk more about that tonight. But tell us about your very first deal. When was it? Where was it? The whole thing. I was brand new in the real estate business and uh, didn't know squat about squat, but I'd just gotten a broker's license up in Missouri and uh, <clears throat> had to go to school three days before you could take the test and then the test was all handwritten and it took one month for me to get the results back to know I passed that thing or not. But <clears throat> it was a pretty intensive test. but. Anyway, the day I got my license, or found out that I'd passed the test, <coughs> I was going to work with another broker that owned a, a Gaslight real estate franchise, Warrensburg, Missouri. And on that day, his daughter was born, and his first daughter was born, and we sold 40 acre uh, to a couple guys that was going to build houses for a subdivision. <coughs> So your very first deal was a subdivision development? A subdivision development. <clears throat> and I sold the first house that they built in there and was trying to sell the second one, but that guy had to sell his house. And, um, in order so, to be able to buy? In order to be able to buy that house. And <clears throat> so I found somebody who wanted to buy his house. So this but is all you acting as a broker? That's me acting as a broker. And so this... Got the first guy, well, the last guy, I guess, down the food chain. <clears throat> it was a little old house. About back in the 70s, houses were like big old nice houses, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. Well, this this house was ten thousand dollars. And so I thought, well, if I buy this house and get a commission off of that one, and selling that one and get a commission off of that one, and he buys this one over here and gets a commission off of that one, I get off. So I got three commissions, and I use that as a down payment to buy that one house. Awesome. That's my first deal. Okay. <laughs> I wish we had a whiteboard. I know. But if you're tracking, he was a, a real estate broker, and he was helping his clients. But what he found was in order to do the deals, he had to help them solve some problems, right? Like needing to sell a house, things like that. Um, so... I rented that thing for a long time, too. Several so years. what year was this? That would have been uh, 1975. And so you bought a, tell me about the house. You bought, what was it, like a three-bedroom, two-bedroom house? Uh, no, I don't even remember how many bedrooms it had. But, but you bought it, the money, you, was it 10000 you bought it for and you put so much down? Yeah, yeah. Use the commissions, down payment, and I, I did go get a bank loan for that one. Okay. One of the about three I've had in 45 years. <laughs> so he went to the bank, um, used his commission money as a down payment um, to buy this, and you kept it as a rental? Yep, yeah. Okay, um, so a few things here. So he did use a um, bank, but he used his commissions as his down payment. And so I think a lot of times, um, real estate agents, keep that in mind. Like, it's not, it doesn't have to just be your salary. It could be something you use um, to help you toward deals, um, and then but he he was having to help multiple people solve their problems for him to be able to do those deals. So if that's your first deal, tell me about your second and the lessons you learned from it. Okay, second one. Um, let's see where I actually was buying the property. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think. The duplex? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I used uh, my commissions on that one, too. As a down payment? But, I, I actually, but you structured seller financing on these deals, and your commissions was the down payment. Well, this next one. Oh, no, no, not seller financing. This yeah, banks. The next one, um, I used my GI Bill, because I was in the military when I got my broker's license. So I, when I got out, I moved to Lee Summit, Missouri. Same franchise, but a different franchisee recruited me to manage his office. So when I moved to that area, Lee Summit, Missouri, bought a duplex on my GI Bill. 
Wow. And um, you, of so course, used my commissions for you know uh, closing costs and that sort of thing. Nothing down. I moved in one side, and rented out the other side. And so the house had. Yeah. One of the one of the biggest mistakes that I started making right there, and I made several of them, is uh, one of the uh, real estate agents that I was managing in that office just kept twisting my arm up behind my back, mm -hmm. and I ended up selling that to him because mm -hmm. I bought another house across town. So you moved. So you bought another house and moved into it. I bought another house, moved in, rented that. Was was doing that, and he all he wanted that thing. And I mean he twisted my arm up behind my back and ended up selling it to him. Subject to <laughs> my VA loan. Oh. Okay. So, what, so, so, around, so this subject, was in the 70s. First and, subject to. So he sold this property and that VA loan that you had on it that you got with the GI Bill, you sold it to this guy. Basically, he took over making those payments That's on the loan. Mm -hmm. Subject to the existing loan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, why do you regret? Why do you regret that? That duplex, I think I paid like thirty-five thousand for it. Yes. And now it's probably worth two fifty, three hundred. Three hundred. Yeah. Where it yeah. is. I've done that. Big mistake. Big mistake. Um, and I wasn't. I didn't quit making mistakes right there either. <laughs> so something I learned: if you don't regret selling a house yet, you haven't been in the business long enough. Um, and so that was actually one of the biggest reasons that converted me to learn creative financing was because I cut my teeth flipping and wholesaling pretty early on um, and I had a deal, I had two deals that I wholesaled that forced me to go learn how to get the money to do the deals because I only wholesaled them to another investor because I did have access to the money. I couldn't, I couldn't get it but, but there, I've got a, not as good of a spread but I have one um, that if I ever need, if I ever need to like re-spark a fire, I just go drive by it and, or look up what it's worth right now. So, but the reality is, and um, Jack, um, no, John Schaub said, um, I recently read something where John said, what is a house doing um, for me today that I sold five years ago? And it gets you thinking, mm -hmm. right? Don't get me wrong, it gets food on the table today. Just killing the chickens, what you're doing. So the other day, so so Leon, you were licensed at that time, so a license broke it, and you were starting to do some deals yourself. Um, so what year was this, and what did it look like for you to be an agent during that time? 1976, 77, along in there. Um, interest rates were six, seven, eight percent, nine percent. You know, somewhere I don't remember exactly what they were, but they were six, seven, eight, nine percent. Wasn't slowing anything down, and we did a lot of subject twos back in those days. And, and before so 1986, VA and FHA loans did not have new home sale clauses in them. Yeah. So you know, you would uh, uh, take over, buy something subject to. The lending company would send you a little one sheet of paper for you to fill out all your information and tell them all about you and all that kind of stuff. You know what we did with them? Threw them in the trash can. Didn't need them. So, you know. They we, couldn't call it due. They, they couldn't call it due. And, I mean, it's just the way it was. And then there was a lot of people. Um, sellers would sell uh, subject to on VA and FHA loans and carry back a little second. Four, three, four, five thousand dollars, eight thousand for their equity. For their equity, part of their equity. So I mean, so, that was really common. There was, there was second mortgages. We used to get these MLS books delivered every week, and they were about that thick for the Kansas City MLS. And one of our challenges was is figuring out how to get rid of all those books. You know, they'd stack up real fast, and you have like fifty agents, and, and every one of them gets a book. Um, it's it's uh, something yeah something to get rid of and uh, this was before computers of course and you could take the MLS book I used to do it and just go down through there and and back in those days they would list how much the first mortgage was when they listed it and, and if there was a second on there they would put like you know forty five hundred dollar uh, second on there 
So there was all kinds of creative things you could do with that. What did you used to do when you see that? I know the story. Tell the story. Well, you could you could do go through and find those seconds. <laughs> this is a little mischievous. <laughs> the sellers, I mean the holders of the second, might not even know that the the new buyer had it for sale listed on the MLS. If it was a forty-five hundred dollars second, you could call them up and say. Uh, hey, I'll give you two thousand dollars for that. Yeah. You've all heard of J.G. Woodworth. I want my money and I want it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could buy the note, and a month later the house closes and pays you all forty-five hundred dollars. <laughs> so I mean, and, and, and you can still do that kind of stuff today, mm -hmm. you know. Wow. Um, so that's I mean, the no-buying just... world in a synopsis. <laughs> yeah, cool. But yeah, I mean, you know, it was it was it was simple back then. Separate. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so a few things. Real estate agents, he was helping his retail clients sell houses and buy houses with creative financing. Um, and it was, I mean, how many agents did you have in your office at the time? Like up to 55 at one time, I think. And so you're having to help them understand this so that they can have help their sellers and their buyers to buy their owner occupied properties this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, um, I had I had two secretaries, and and the brokerage offices actually did close the seller on about ninety five percent of the deals. They would close. You would do the warranty deed, and you would do the closing statements, and then you would send all that over to the to the title company or whoever. If there was a new loan going to be on it, then uh, you would send it either over to the title company or over to the lending institution and they close the uh, buyer's part of it. And so what do those two secretaries do for you? They sat there and typed all day long, every day, because you had to just put it in a typewriter. And what I had to do was hand fill out the, the like the, they weren't HUD ones back then, but it's closing statements. So you do all those by hand, hand it to somebody and they type it. And, and the then, same thing with the warranty deed, you know, and you write all the subject to language in there. So, and like that. so for for like your agents, imagine instead of going to a title company and the lender, the the, the agent, um, no, I'm sorry, the the attorney, fill gets you the deed, the HUD one, all that with their processing team. Instead, you're showing up with all that. Isn't that wild? So for those of you who don't know, Leon has taught me a lot about the paperwork. Um, so much in fact about the paperwork and when he said that I was like that makes sense <laughs> it makes sense because you had I mean how many of you guys would know the first thing to do with that I mean Leanne are you an attorney no have you ever been one no not in a past well, life I'm going back to law school though you're going back to law school yeah because I heard that they live to be 900 and something years old <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go, that's how many hours they bill for <laughs> Some of you are going to be driving home and that one's going to hit you. Um, so Leon, how did you get introduced to creative financing? Um, can I tell about one more deal? Yes, go okay. ahead. I told right, Mama so try not to stop it. After a story. couple of years of no warm meals at home, working late at night, filling out those forms and whatnot, you know, just to stay ahead of the ball game. Had a guy across the street, there was a service station across the street from the uh, real estate office, and there was a bar over here. Had really good hot dogs at the bar. Because I ate a lot of them at lunchtime and run over and gorge yourself and hurry back to keep filling out those deals. And um, there was a guy that worked at the service station who had changed my wall a couple times, and you know, I'd see him all the time and whatnot. So one day I go over to get a hot dog at lunch and he's over there getting a hot dog at the bar. And he said, hey, I need to talk to you about selling my house. And I said, okay. I said, when do you want to get together? You know, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go get a listing. <coughs> and um, so he said, well, come see me Saturday morning. So I go over there Saturday morning and I walk through the house. It's a four bedroom, uh, really nice home. It's it's not very old. The house is about three years old at that time. And uh, so a pretty house. Yeah, it's a nice house. Full basement, two car garage, really nice area, great, great area at least Summit, Missouri. 1809 West 2nd Street. And we'll look it up. 
see what it's worth today. <clears throat> but um, so I go out and I go through the house and did my market analysis and I said, you know, I think we could sell it for fifty-five thousand dollars. And you know, we sit down in the living room and we're talking after I'd done my market analysis and I knew what the comps were in the area and that sort of thing. And he said, well, I really need to sell it fast. And I said, well, I mean, and, and there was another real estate agent, uh, agency or brokerage down the street, Harden and Stockton was their name. I don't even think they had, and there was about 10 old women in there. They had to be at least 45 or 50 years old. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so that's that's the way I looked at it when I'm in my twenties, you know. Yeah. And and those rascals, they would go out and they'd tell somebody that their property was worth ten grand more than what it really was, just so they'd get the listing. Son, you had to work hard to get a listing up against them, you know. So and then they'd come back in a couple weeks and beat them down and sell it. So that was their game. <coughs> so <clears throat> anyway, uh, the guy, I said, "Well, maybe we can get it for forty-nine thousand. And he said, uh, "And the house was worth fifty-five, but man, the properties were appreciating like crazy. You could buy something market value and sell it six months later and make a profit." And uh, he said, "Man, I need to sell it fast." And I said, "Well, you know, forty-nine it ought to sell pretty fast." And he said, "Well, look, I got something I want you to read." So he goes back to his bedroom, comes back, gives me a letter. He's three months behind on his FHA loan, and he's about to get foreclosed on. Okay, and he said, "Why don't you just buy it from me?" So I mean, it's like this opportunity is just slapping me in the face, and then you know, it's taken me a while to wake up and look at it. And so I said, well, how much you want for it? He said, I'll, I'll take what I paid for it three years ago. And I said, what's that? He said, twenty-one nine. Oh. And he owed 19000 on it. Okay. So uh, I said, okay. So we wrote up a contract, and I went scrambling around to get me $3,000. He owed $5,000 to the IRS. <clears throat> which I called them up, got them on the phone, sent them $500, and they released the house. Oh. Um, the ex-wife, um, she was owed a bunch of money, so we went and gave her $800, and I took a deed, which I know how to type, how to do. <laughs> took a deed over there, and she signed the deed, and I gave her $800, and there was two or three other deal things that I had to clear up on the title. Bought that house. Moved in that house. Painted, put new carpet, brought my first son home to that house. Mm -hmm. And uh, about six months later, or look, well, first of all, with that house, I said, dang, you know, I thought I knew everything. I was a hot shot broker, mm -hmm. okay? But I thought, man, I need to cookie cutter this deal. You know, I just picked up $25,000 or more, 30000 in equity in this house. And, you know, I have to work a lot of long hours to make that kind of money back in those days. And I thought, how can I do this again? So, I mean, I just kind of lucked into that deal. So, I went to doing research and I found out in Missouri that <clears throat> how they did the foreclosure process and they had the, how they had to advertise the trustee sales. So I thought, hmm. So all I did was get the independence examiner, Jackson County, Missouri, and I started reading the public notices, and looking at every trustee's sale, picking out the ones that have been on the market for a long time. And man, I'm going out, I'm scared. Not Crazy. <laughs> Here's a guy, his house is fixing to get foreclosed <coughs> tomorrow. Yeah. I'm knocking on this hat and door today. Can I help you? Yes, sir. I was wondering if you'd like to sell your house. No, I'm not interested in selling my house. <laughs> they foreclosed on it the next day and he lost his house. So I thought, i got to say something different. <laughs> so the next one I went to, hi, my name's Leon Johnson, and I noticed your house is listed in the uh, trustees sales in the Jackson County Court 
court uh, system, and I was wondering if you'd like to sell it before it was foreclosed on and save your credit. Come right in. Yeah. And you have to sit there an hour and listen to why they got to where they are. Most important thing to do. And I cannot tell you how many houses we bought subject to uh, doing that very thing right there just because I lucked into that first deal. So I started doing a bunch of them. So I had a few of those houses and then I learned this little little deal. Um, do you want me to stop so you can ask No, questions? keep going, keep going. No, I told her I don't want to do this, keep going. So, so I went to, I was also taking, and this is something that everybody ought to do. If you have a college around that's teaching real estate courses, don't go there to that. Just ask to if you can pay to sit in on it. Just to sit in. You want the knowledge. You're not looking for a degree. So I was doing that at Rockhurst College, and um, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. I, I told you I don't. When you get on your roll with your stories, I don't want to stop you. So, so you were going and sitting at Rockhurst. That's when you had that professor. Yeah. So the professor, I was taking several courses at night, time. and and um, the the finance professor <laughs> was going to be gone for two nights. It's like Tuesday, Thursday night class or something like that. Rockhurst College uh, down in Kansas City, and uh, so he had this guest speaker come in. And um, the guy walks in, standing in front of the room, there's like 200 students in there. And there were some older folks in there, you know, not just college kids necessarily. And I think interest rates were like about 9 or 10% then, somewhere along in there. And he said, how many people in here uh, would pay 10% interest for a good investment? And just about everybody in the room held their hand up. How many people pay 12%? A few people put their hands down. A few. How many people would pay 15%? My hand's still up, and, and there's might have been two or three people out of two or three hundred that did that. And uh, he said, uh, how many people would pay 50%? My hand was the <laughs> only one that was up. He said, why would you do that? I, I said, well, for two reasons. If it's a property that I'm buying way below market value, mm -hmm. and I'm only going to keep the loan for a very short period of time, mm -hmm. okay, 50% is annual, right? So if you only keep it a month, that's one twelfth of 50%. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I mean, don't ever worry about price. I mean, you got to do this within reason, okay? Mm -hmm. And don't worry about interest rates. If the deal works, those two things don't matter at all. If the deal works, what's the second reason you'd pay fifty percent? So the first one is if you get it at a, at a deep discount. What's right, the second? The short term. And the short term. time, the time, time factor. So a short period of time. Short term. Let me ask you this: anybody ever in here ever done a deal with somebody and you didn't have any money, and you got somebody to put up all the money, and you did the work and did the deal? <laughs> and y'all split it 50-50? Yeah. You just paid 50% interest. Yes. And, and, if you, and if you flipped it in 90 days, you paid 50% in 90 days. So trip four times that. You paid 200% interest. And it was still a good deal for you. Does that make sense? That's a whole new way to think about the whole thing. And if that don't make sense, ask me later. We can talk about that. But time is one of the most important parts. So anyway, I bought several houses from my uh, deal, and this guy, this guy says, uh, I want to see you after class. So he asked me to go to lunch, this guy did. And uh, it was one of the best and worst things I ever did because about eight months later, he zapped me for 400 <coughs> grand. Okay, learned a great lesson that. It took me about three years of being totally numb to come out from under that. But during that period of time, during that period of time, um, I'm still at the brokerage for a while, and um, he that guy taught me something. He called them carry bags. But he had a bunch of investors with a lot of money, and we started buying houses and 
for them and splitting deals and all that kind of stuff. And there was 400,000 worth of equity that, because we had bought a ton of real estate in a short period of time. But, uh, and it's a long story how I got out. I, I went to five different lawyers before I could explain one of them could understand hmm. what kind of tangled up mess I was in and how to get out of it, hmm. okay? So I, I, I've had those down times too. And anybody that tells you they haven't, they might lie to you about other stuff. But, um, or they haven't been in it long enough. Yeah, but anyway, this guy did teach me something about carrybacks. And boy, the minute I learned that, and you don't want to be this, it's called being technique driven. Boy, I learned a new technique and I was going to go hunt a situation to use it. Okay? I get a new tool, I'm going to go figure out where to use that tool. But today, I tell you that's backwards. Go find the situation, and if you don't know what tool to use, call Courtney. She probably knows, you know, whatever to, to help put the deal together. But anyway, he told me uh, about buying something owner financed, but don't use that property as collateral. So I went through my MLS book while I was hunting a situation, and lo and behold, one of my agents in my office hairdresser, worked part-time. It was her parents' house that she was selling. She had rented it for a while, and, and she was had some of those professional tenants that I, I love mm -hmm. because they helped me find deals. Mm -hmm. um, get a discount. Uh, and get a discount. Yeah, and get a discount. But anyway, um, she owned her house free and clear. She wanted to sell it. And boy, I couldn't wait till Saturday to talk to her. She came in. I said, Brenda, I want to buy your parents' house. We toured it. I've been in this house. And um, she had it listed as on the MLS. I don't know why I didn't think about it until I saw it in there. And I said, look, I'm going to buy the house, and I'll give you um, $3,000 down. And for the balance, I think it was $19,000. I think I paid $20,000. 21.9 for that house maybe, or 22,000, pay 22 for that house. And this house, the back of the house right now backs up to Adams Mark Hotel, which is across the street from Royals and Chief Stadium, right across the street, Adams Mark Hotel. It's 4002 Ditton, if you want to look up the address. But anyway, um, I said, I'll give you $3,000 down, that leaves $19,000, and I'd like for you to take this house over here, a second on it for $9,500, and I'll give you a second on this other house over here for $9,500, and I'll pay you so much a month, and the rents on those two houses paid for the first and the second mortgage on both of them. Everybody <coughs> yeah. In her parents' house, when he bought it, had no loan on it because he picked the loans on other properties he had. You catching that part? So I went to the bank, which was a friend of mine on the bank, and uh, I borrowed $20,000. And he said, I need an appraisal. Would you draw me up some appraisal? So I did my own appraisal on the bank. <laughs> and uh, so the he, he needed something in his file. Yeah. So, um, don't you wish you could do that these days? So, I took in that appraisal out there and he loaned me $20,000. And I went to the closing where well, I deposited that in my account and I took uh, $3,000 to the closing, which I think we did that. In, I think I did the closing in the office. So, anyway. Bill um, had it so easy back then. Yeah, it was easy. Things were good back then. <laughs> and, and so I gave her the three thousand dollars, right? Um, and I went home with seventeen thousand dollars and another house, which I took that money. And, but it was a, there was a problem with that twenty thousand dollar loan. I, I, so I went and bought some other houses, subject to with that seventeen thousand. I, I bought one in Gulfport, Mississippi. One, two, three, Brentwood. Drive, oh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Anyone else amazed is? he remembers all these exact addresses from the 70s? Yes. Yeah. Especially this late at night. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's past your bedtime. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> I bought several houses with that that money. 
And uh, there, but the problem with it, there was a one year balloon. Oh. Okay, oh, that's why I say balloons are balloon clowns. clowns. Yeah. Oh, Explain what a balloon is. Well, that means uh, it's all new out. one year from now. Yep. But the Dude. real problem was something that's happening to a lot of people right now is interest rates went from 10% to 18% during that year. And I would rented it for a while and I thought, man, I need to sell this thing. And by then I'd gone to Jack Miller and John Schaub's course. This was 1978 then. And uh, I'd learned a about options and things you can do and you know you can sell and you can do this today sell a house on VA but you can't give them any money but you can buy an option from them and use they can use that for their down payment did you know you can do that so I had this guy work for the railroad that wanted to buy the house and it was like 18% but he wanted to buy the house and I was sweating it because my one year is almost up okay Interest rates 18%. The guy didn't have any money for down payment, but he could afford the payments. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll buy an option from you to buy the house back from you, and, and, and I'll pay your um, uh, down payment and closing costs and all that to buy the house. And, uh, but I want an option to buy the house back from me for five years, and each year I'll have to pay you $500 more than what you paid for. Mm -hmm. Okay? Wow. So I just had the right to buy the house for five years, mm -hmm. and if I exercised that option, I'd have to give him $500 more each year. So that was way back when how. But you could do this with commercial property, all kinds of stuff. About three days before the closing, he called me up, Mr. Leon, I've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, my heart sunk. I got this loan coming due with my friend's bank, and you know, interest rates are 18 percent. He said, "I just got transferred to St. Louis. So I'm not going to be able to buy the house." No. Oh crap! What am I going to do? I said, "I tell you what. If you'll go ahead and close, I'll go ahead and pay you $500 <laughs> to, just to close." And he did. So I got the money to pay the the um, my bank back. Okay. And um, then I turned around and sold it for uh, $2,000 on a subject two on his loan. Because he had the VA. No, that was an FHA, FHA in that FHA. case, yeah. But so anyway. let me say so any of this, if it's here, yeah. take notes. This is something I'm going to learn. Take notes for future you. Yeah. But catch some of the principles he shares in the meantime, right? Catch some of those principles. You know, he has not been without some issues with his back against the wall or, you know, the interest rates. You know, thankfully we're not dealing with 18%, mm. but it was not what, you know, he did a deal and wasn't expecting it to go to that high, you know. So what did he have to do? He had to find his way out through structuring a deal, right? Um, so do you mind if we get back to the questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, well, hey, look, let me make sure because I think we answered some of them. I said, how are you finding, the, finding these sellers back then to do these creative deals? You told us something. You were knocking on doors for pre foreclosures. Um, these were people you were looking on the MLS with some stuff that had problems. You were looking in, you know, the courthouse records and then looking on the MLS. Um, and then these were also, you know, people who you were talking to who were coming. To you. Mm -hmm. So tell me this. Um, that's how you were finding deals back then to do these creative deals. How are you finding sellers now? Because you're still actively doing deals. How do you find sellers today? to do the creative deals you do today. Okay, I have to tell you, I'm not looking. They come to you. Yeah, Adam, yep. my son, mm -hmm. he does a lot of marketing and, um, you know, they, he does a lot of wholesaling and they do fix and flips and we do, you know, I, I hate construction. My mm -hmm. recurring fantasy is, is I go into Home Depot and. Lowe's and do something so obscene that they bar me from ever going in there ever again. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, no it, it's a dream because he never wants to have to go back in there. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that has to do with construction. You know, if you're a contractor, don't tell me to go get two gallons of paint. I'll get the wrong kind. Uh, don't tell me to go get 14 doors because I don't know left hand from right hand. 
Um, you know, all those kind of things. I just, I don't like that stuff. And I can tell you stories about that. But, um, uh, what, was, what was the question? How do you find the sellers? Oh, so Adam, like, hold on, we got to so, answer the question. So how do you find Adam, the sellers now? So Adam, through his marketing, a lot of, a lot of the last deals, um, you know, he finds them, and if it looks like a seller finance possibility, long-term hold, hey, Dad, here's one you need to go on. So I, I do those. Um, and I have people that call me just about every day. I have a lot of bird dogs, uh, from uh, letter carriers to uh, people who do lawn. I had the guy that was at my house doing landscaping today gave me one last week, and, and uh, I don't know if it's going to go anywhere or not. It was a couple of school teachers had a really nice brick house out in the country on like two acres and the, they don't know how to manage property they don't know about day building and um, mm -hmm. and so say that quote there that quote you have which one humility um, <coughs> we're talking about um, the, the humility if you, we start out seeking opportunities that one you know, we start out in life seeking opportunities, but if we are honest, trustworthy, and competent, opportunities will start to seek you, okay? So, you know, I have people call all the time. I've got several people I've done, I do deals with, and they find deals, their wives find deals. I can sit here and say about me and Eddie and his wife, how many she's brought to us and the kind of deals that she's brought. Well, and, um, so there's this idea here you know, that just I have as many as I want to go check out. You know. Well, but here's the thing: is very early on, you were pounding the pavement, knocking doors, going to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. But right. then sending letters. Sending letters, but then I think one of the big lessons here, and this is probably the big one of the biggest, probably top three lessons you've ever taught me um, over the last four or five years, um, has been to give your efforts time to compound. Oh, a lot of people say, oh, I hate going out and pounding the pavement and knocking doors. Well, understand you got to do that in the beginning, but then eventually people start knowing, you know, you do business with people and they say, oh, um, well, Leon did good business with me. He's a good person that does good business and he helped my sister and, you know, gives me uh, someone. Like who tenants, me like tenants uh, that I've had years ago still refer people to me to rent, to buy or to sell. You know, you just treat people good and it, and it comes back to you. So there's a few um, things too that it's like, for example, too many people quit too soon. Um, a lot of times people don't tell other people what they do. In 2020, I had this major, end of 2019, early 2020, I had this major shift. Because if you go back on my social media, I did not tell anyone. There might be one post that said I, I was in real estate. And I had been in real estate for years at that point. But I just wasn't talking about it. And it was like this light bulb went off my head that like a closed mouth does not get fed. And it was like, um, actually Adam, I think it was Adam that said, hey, Courtney, if you went to some of your neighbors, friends from high school, cousins, whatever, and asked them, what do you do for a living? What would they say? Well, I did that. Nobody knew. Half of them thought I was a realtor. I said, no, not quite. Um, <laughs> so, but like they, something with houses, right? So my message wasn't clear. So if they and then I remember around that time a, a girl I had gone to um, church with had just someone told me oh you know so and so just got she's a single mom she's got foreclosed on mm -hmm. and I just literally said oh my gosh I wish she knew what I did well whose fault is that I felt this level of personal responsibility because someone could have told me reached out to me sent her my way and I could have helped potentially helped her right and so literally my mind had to shift to start doing that. But then here's another, and I'll just be my last thing is, so many people do business in various different states and it's like, don't get me wrong, that I'm, I'm, I don't want to de deter you from that, but it's so hard to have a reputation when you're constantly moving the dot, you know, the ball of where you're at, right? Um, so kind of keep that part in mind. There is some value to staying somewhere and doing consistent business in an area because you build a reputation and it can give your, um, one of the mentors that he introduced me to, Pete, and Leon, you have these stories too, um, Pete has been the second most influential in my career. Um, Pete has done 
70 something deals with four families. 70 something deals with four families over the last you know, handful of decades. That blows your mind. But the reality here is, how many times, you know, how many times have, one of the biggest lessons, how many times have you talked to a seller you bought a house from years ago? A lot of people are like, oh, let me drop them and leave them once I get what I, what I want, what I got. So one of the big things to open my eyes, my eyes, up, my eyes up to is, it's how you do um, real estate matters, right? Because people want to do good business with good people, especially down here in the South. Well, if you don't give your efforts time to compound, stick with it, stay in the, you know, you know, build a name for yourself, the next thing you know, in the beginning, you're having to seek all those opportunities, but then there's a click that happens. And I'm thankful it's happened to me. I've been in this business about nine, nine to 10 years now, and I'm not having to go door knock like I used to. Um, call, you know, cold call every single day. I still do some, but, um, I had a, a woman call me three three weeks ago who, um, March 2020, I was under contract to buy her house from her sister, and a situation happened where you know, COVID happened. She said, "Hey, can we can we cancel the contract because the world's so crazy right now?" And I said, "Well, just call me when y'all are ready." Well, she called me three weeks ago, mm-hmm. and so uh, I'm like, "Hey, thanks for letting me go back at it." You know, and you, and you let her out of the contract. Back yeah, then. I did. Some people said, "Well, I want to go sue because I, there's a thing called specific." I can make you sell. The stupidest thing in the world to do. So, tell me this. Oh, let's get to number seven on the question because I think we might actually have a, a hope at getting to number ten. Um, over the years, what are some common mistakes you've seen investors make? Because mm-hmm. so, so I want to preface this with he has been investing since 1975. I wanted to specifically come and interview him. I've had him come and share multiple things over the years here. But a lot of people are jumping on the internet these days who at best have been investing since 2008 during that down market. And they're like, let me help you go through a down market and invest in real estate and take advantage of a you know, recession. Um, I have not been investing, I have not been through a down market. I don't even wanna to pretend to tell you what to do. So what do I do? I just like tie myself to his hip and be like, like a little like puppy, Leon, what are you doing right these days? What are you, you know? Um, so you've been through numerous market cycles. 18% interest, how many of you guys like, you know, yeah. cringed at that? Um, so Leon, what are some mistakes you've seen over the decades you've been doing this that investors commonly make? And let me tell you one that's going on right now. Taking bad advice from gurus and spending them 10 or $20,000 for that bad advice. Yeah. You know, a lot of those guys, they see a deal, they do a deal, and they start teaching for twenty thousand dollars. So, and and there's so much bad information out there. I mean, it's just it's scary, you know. And um, but you know, there's a few common things. That, you know the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, the old tortoise won, right? He won the race. Well, this business is kind of like that too, you know. And Courtney said, "Give your efforts time to compound." Concentrate on hitting base hits, not home runs every day. <coughs> um, that, that's one way to look at it. You know, if some people come in and they get too big too fast, they can't manage it. Uh, there's a guy in Pascagoula, Mississippi, I know that in a very short time, about 40 years ago, bought like 600 houses. But he had about 100 of them or more vacant. He couldn't manage them. And it was, it was a bad, bad deal. I looked on the internet the other day. He still got about 35. I looked on... Uh, yeah, Delta. We Delta looked at it together. Just, yeah. He still has about 35, 40 houses there in his <coughs> name. In his name. Personal name, not an LLC. Yeah. Wow. Um, but, uh, you know, he lost a lot of money for himself and other people doing that, getting too big too fast. Another thing is going buying big, complicated deals that you're not ready for. Um, so you're talking like jump into multifamily, Big commercial, commercial stuff, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and look, uh, there might be some of you guys in the room, maybe not, but I'm going to tell you, you start dealing in that commercial world with people who know what they do, they will cut your throat That's true. And, and throw you in a garbage can, mm-hmm. um, you know, and they'll cut you 47 ways from Sunday, but um, so, I, so I say getting start out, big too soon, too quick. Yeah. 
dealing with big complicated deals um, and and uh, I don't know that's a that's a couple of them there's there's probably a lot more um, what about you know, this um, so something we were talking about um, a lot of people and you were talking about how this almost hurt you too is that short-term financing oh yeah oh yeah 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 that's good I made notes from I had that in my mind but yeah <clears throat> You know, people, have you ever heard people, or have you asked somebody, hey, how many houses do you have? How many doors do you have? See, that's a totally irrelevant, whatever they tell you, if it's 1,500 houses, or two houses, or 30 houses, 70 houses, it's totally an irrelevant number, okay? Um, what really matters is how much you're putting in the bank every month, how much you're cash flowing, and as those loans say, because somebody could have a hundred houses, and you've got three, and and you've got yours financed correctly, and man, they're cash flowing, and and you get talking, well, how many houses you got? Oh, hundred. I got a hundred, man. Good. And uh, and you get to feeling bad because you only have three. Don't, because that guy might have sure. balloons coming due in higher interest rate times. They might have, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just negative cash flow. Negative, negative cash flow. Mm -hmm. It could be a horrible <laughs> situation to have a hundred deals <coughs> if it's not set up right. So you know, just be aware of that, um, and and don't compare yourself to others. You know, you may have heard the dessert errata. You ever heard of that? D I S I R D A. I think. You told me one time I couldn't find it online. Um, uh, online? Try to find it. Desert Arada. It says, "Go placidly amid the noise and haste, yeah. and remember what peace there may be in silence." Uh, and that's that's the first line. I don't know the rest of it, but down in the down in the middle of it, it says, "Don't ever compare yourself to others, because you'll become vain and bitter." Because there's always uh, greater persons than you and lesser persons than you. You know, don't worry about all that. <coughs> let, let me just tell you this. And I, I've said this a thousand times. Courtney's probably sick of hearing it. But you can have two houses side by side. <laughs> exactly. You've heard it. <laughs> uh, built by the same builder, same quality, same size, same school, same taxes, <clears throat> same everything. Both of them very nice houses. One of them can be a great investment and the other one can be a horrible, horrible investment. And the difference is one thing, financing. Okay? But you know, the thing, I've done this before back when I was a broker. Run an ad, you know, back in those days we had to do it, write our ads by a certain day, all the salesmen would have to write their ads and we'd turn them in and whatnot, you know. And if it was kind of old junky house out somewhere or another, that was an investor special. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a pet peeve to me these days to see something that says investor special. So I want to know what makes it such a good deal for an investor, you know? Because to me, a good investment's a nice home in a nice area that I can write to nice, <coughs> rent to nice people at average interest, at average rents, you know? Um, not necessarily some junker. And that could be a great investment, but that nice property financed correctly for me as a long-term whole person, that's what makes a great investment. Um, let me tell you this. Um, ideal investment. I-D-E-A-L. And I'm not going to go super deep in this, but in our, de in, our, in our deal we're doing here in the next week, um, I'm going to dive into it and show taxes and returns on it and all that kind of stuff. But an ideal investment is one that you can get income from, one that you can depreciate. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about when, it, when I say depreciate, it, it's not something you have to write a check for. It's a, it's a government write-off, income tax write-off, okay? E, I-D-E, -E, equity build-up uh, through... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the uh, tenants are paying it, the mortgage for you, and so 
each month as that loan am amortizes, you're getting equity built up. A for appreciation, which you can get a couple different ways through just normal market. And the other one is through um, uh, forced appreciation, like go pay it, you know, do things that's gonna make, that you don't spend a whole bunch that makes the value go up. And leverage, um, you know, I can prove to you that a lot of times the loans that you owe on good properties are more valuable than the house itself, mm -hmm. the property itself. I like single family houses because everybody understands them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they're easy to liquidate for the most part compared to big multifamily things. When you rent them, you get a different kind of tenant. If you look for the right kind, you get kinds that are more homeowner mentality, and and they're your most valuable asset. So, so we got through like three of those questions ahead. Um, I, one of the things that was, if you could wave a magic wand to get your ideal investment, what would it be and why? And that'd be a single family home in a nice neighborhood, mm -hmm. nice house in a nice neighborhood that you can that you could rent to a nice family yep. that has good financing. Yep. Safe financing. Long-term safe financing. That's very critical. A lot of people have long, um, they might have long-term, but it might all, not always be safe. Yeah, feasible, that's safe. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and you just explained why you like single family. And I like mobile homes too. Mobile homes on land. Um, you own some mobile home parks, you've earned some commercial stuff. Um, so it's not that he hasn't dabbled in those worlds, he just has a preference. Um, Easy to manage. Easy to manage. Do you want to talk about an example of a current deal you're working on right now? But well, uh, we've got time? seven minutes. Okay, what about that one I just told you about? Uh, that, is that complicated? <laughs> Y'all want to hear some moving parts of how he does deal with multiple people? Okay, let's All right, go ahead. So about three years ago. Meat potatoes here, we'll, we'll ask for that. Yeah, I'll hustle through it. But about three years ago, um, one of my friend's dad, who is Eddie's daddy, um, he's now like 83 years old. Um, he still likes to build stuff, which I let him do that. But he said, y'all ought to, you and Eddie ought to go buy this piece of land up here. And, and I actually <coughs> called the guy about 10 years ago, tried to buy, get him to sell the land. He didn't want to sell it. So I called him and said, yeah, I'd be interested in selling it. So it, Eddie's dad's <coughs> encouragement uh, to me and Eddie to go buy this piece of land, and I'm going to just use we so I can get through this thing. So I went and talked to this guy, and it was 12 acres. They lived like 60, 70 miles away, 60 miles away from us. Had this piece of land, and it had been a, a horse arena, and it's about a mile and a half from my house. And I was very familiar with the property. I went to school across the street from it. It used to have a baseball field there. <clears throat> so anyway, we go talk to the guy. And he wanted about $2,500 an acre too much for this 12 acres, 12 and a half acres. So above, 2,500 above market. Yeah, rate. I figured it's worth four, and I think we paid 6,500 for an acre for it. Now, why would we do that? So I said, okay. And, and by the way, a, a good three-hour conversation is why wholesale terms is better than a wholesale price. Way better. I'll take wholesale terms any day over wholesale price for a lot of reasons. So this will kind of so help explain that. Let me. Sometimes that gets difficult. That discounted those discounted terms, those wholesale, those good terms versus a good price. Some people just get so fixated on, well, I just need a discount. But he was willing to overpay because of the terms. Keep going. Yeah, and the terms was this. <coughs> I offered the guy uh, 10000 his price. I said, okay, we'll pay your price, but we'll pay you $10,000 down, and we'll pay it out over X period of time. I forgot what that was, but I know the payments are $532.15 because I write a check <laughs> every month. And uh, so anyway, we bought this 12 acres, and there was four acres wooded in the back, and the lady who 
reads the meters and works for the water department knew that we were buying it and she said, well, y'all sell me that four acres back there. Yeah. Okay, so we put 10,000 down, 532, uh, 15 until it's paid for. First month, before we even made our first payment, we sold her on a contract for deed. Y'all call that something else? Bond for deed over here. I sold it on a contract for deed, 3,000 down, 600 a month. <laughs> so we've never made a payment out of our pocket on that piece of land. So any of you guys who like like the Burr method, infinite return day one for his monthly payments. So then we built two houses, of which that I swore I'd never do again. But my Ed, my friend, and his dad, his dad said, "Look, I'll I'll do the construction loans for you." So we built two houses, made about thirty thousand a piece on those two houses. <laughs> something you do when you buy a piece of land you're going to uh, going to split up you write in the note and deed of trust or mortgage that let's say it's 12 acres in this case um, if we ever want to get releases on any portion of that land then we'll take one twelfth of the remaining balance for the payoff say for an acre okay so we did that with those two houses and paid off that, but we're still paying five, so our mortgage balance went down, right? You get that? Okay, it went down, we're still paying 532.15 every month. And then one of my tenants that I had for six years, several years ago, was working with a lady who needed a place to put a mobile home, so she calls up and uh, we put a uh, septic tank in for her and a power pole and one meter and rented her a lot for $225. Found a mobile home that we could buy for $35,000. We put, took $10,000 of our money. His daddy said, I'll loan you, he's 80 then, about. He said, I'll loan you $40,000 on that for 10 years interest only at 6%. That's $200 a month, okay? So we put that double wide on there and we're renting it for 925 discounted rent. So his monthly payment for that trailer for the private money lenders, $200 a month. Uh, 10 years interest only, 6% interest for 40,000? Yeah, 40,000. $200, $200 a month, he's getting how much in rent? 925. $925. And, and the thing about older <laughs> mobile homes, unlike some of our houses in Hattiesburg and decent areas is 3,000 a year, I think taxes on that how that double wide was like 130 bucks last year. Okay. And Ten dollars a month expense. So, um, and so then uh, the lady that had the water department, you know, bought the four acres that's paying us 600 a month. Um, she knew this little gal whose husband got killed. When they were like in their 20s, had a couple little kids, and she was wanting a place to put them over home. So we dig another septic tank and get another water meter and do all that and put another one on her, rented the lot to her for 225 Well, the first lady we were renting the lot to got a job up in Memphis, so she wanted to sell her mobile home, so we bought it for $25,000. Okay, so now we own the mobile home. It's rented for $800 a month, the first one that we put in there. Okay, and we own it free and clear because rents we've collected, we just paid cash for it. The little girl whose husband got killed, <clears throat> just last month we bought hers because she found a boyfriend, moved out with him. So we bought that one. Eddie's cousin called us up and his mother-in-law went to the nursing home and they had a very, very nice double wide. You drive by, it looks brand new. Seen it. Um, big old nice, and we're gonna rent it for 975. We just got it set up, and um, we paid 12,500 for that. Oh. And we got about 30,000 in it, uh, and we paid for it out of our pocket, so it's it's free and clear. <coughs> awesome. And the other day, a couple of days ago, I wrote that check for 532 dollars and 15 cents. You know how much interest was included in that 532 dollars? 139 bucks. And that goes down a little bit every month as the principal goes up. So our holding cost on the land underneath Various four deals. mobile homes 
it's costing us interest $139 a month. So there's a lot of moving parts in this deal, yeah. but he's still actively in this business, but there's a few things. You hear how many phone calls he's getting? How many people are like, hey, Leon, um, my cousin is so-and-so, they need da 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 You hear how he's telling more about the story of what people need and how he's helping them? One last thing, what did you show me on your phone during dinner? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so you know what's interesting about that deal? And there's another one that's real interesting. It's kind of like that. And we are past things. our time already. All right, well, I'll hurry. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the folks that finance, every time, and I've got a bunch of stuff I bought on or financed, okay? And a lot of them, I get 30-year financing for people over 70. I got one lady, 76 years old, financed to me for 30 years. No balloon, 3% interest, okay? So, and there's a way to, there's things you ask and ways to present that to get that to happen. <clears throat> Which Courtney ain't gonna let me tell you all tonight, so okay. <laughs> but anyway. Right, right. But uh, let, let, let's keep this and then as right, I wrap so, up, I'll, I'll So in, in, that, in that deal right there, what I do on all those owner finance deals, I get their checking account numbers. Yeah. And I go deposit the money those, that 532.15 every month and a whole bunch of others. I drive around the different banks doing this, okay? Hmm. And there's a reason for that. You know, we could do automatic draft and all that. I don't want to do that. Network. So I, I go, and how I keep in touch with all those people that have owned or financed to me, I go drop, go through, drive through, go put the money in the bank, I get a receipt, and I text them. Merry Christmas. Just made, just made the December payment. Happy New Year. Just made the January payment. <laughs> so you showed month. me the text thread to this this woman with the twelve acres. Yeah. So every month those payments he's texting. <coughs> and she's a veterinarian, and and they are they're not hurting for money. Okay. So Eddie and I are just made an offer Friday on a piece of land. We don't even know how many acres it is, but we offer it's to a corporation big corporation and their land person sent us a deal and said make us an offer and we said we don't know how many acres it is but we'll pay this much for it per acre and <clears throat> so I was just thinking you know what I bet you if I go talk to those folks that I've been texting and she texts me back happy fall y'all and you know, every time I make a payment, I'm reaching out and just kind of tapping them on the shoulder. They And I pay them early every month. And uh, I'll bet you anything I can go to them and they will finance that piece of land that I'm buying. Because right now, stock market's Damn. tanking. Yeah. Where else? And I bet you I'll from 6% long term and they'll do it because they trust me. Had another deal a few years ago. In fact, I was telling these guys about it uh, at the beginning there, the guy that I bought this house from, nothing down. I was telling you guys about it. Um, about four months into that deal, the guy calls me up and he says, hey, Leon, I don't know if it'll help you or not, but I got an extra 400000 in my checking account. If you guys can use it in some real estate deals, then, you know. From a guy I, that you bought a house from. from somebody I bought a house from. And we went a year before we... Um, used you used any of it, yeah. didn't even needed any of it or whatever, but every month he gets text from me, you know, <laughs> hey, I just made the payment, and um, just last week, uh, I, one of my tenants has been a tenant for about six or seven years, his girlfriend moves in with him, got a divorce, she got a settlement, and all oh, they're hitting me up to invest, 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 well, that's been a year or more ago, last week, I, 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 it hit me. You know, I need to help them out. She's sitting there with that money, not getting any money. So I borrowed twenty thousand dollars from her, six percent interest only for two years. He just got a private money loan from his tenant. I don't so, even know where I'm going to use it yet, but <laughs> twenty grand from a tenant. I'll take it. You know, loan, so loan big money. He's getting private money from sellers that he got seller financing deals from, and then private money loans from his tenants. Um, so I have to stop you there with the stories because I heard another and then there's another. Well, you know, you guys have family and friends yeah. that are sitting there with a bunch of money, not getting any returns on it hardly. 
a millionaire uh, a year ago was getting a one tenth of one percent. But let's say they were getting one percent. That's ten thousand a year, eight hundred a month. They couldn't rent a mobile home from me on interest from a million bucks. I call them destitute millionaires. Go to them and pay them six percent. You change their whole life. A millionaire, you take them from ten grand to sixty grand a year. What can that do for them? If they're near a family, and treat them right, pay them on time, and you know. So. So anyway. I could let him keep going. We're past time. Um, how many of you guys are like I can listen to Leon talk forever? That that was like when I first met. But like I'm like I just I don't want to stop him. But obviously for the sake of time. Um, so so generally speaking, we this is a, a no pitcheria. We don't come here selling anything. Um, but a lot of you guys know that in March of 2020, um, he was supposed to do a creative finance event in New Orleans. But we all know what happened in March of 2020. So next weekend in Biloxi, um, they're doing the makeup event of it. Honestly, yesterday the hotel, so it's a, it's a weekend seminar. So it's a, these events are free here, but this one is a paid seminar. Um, but honestly, he's gonna be speaking 75% of the time. I'll be speaking in one of the two of the sessions. Um, but honestly, I'm so excited to just go sit, and I've known him for years, and uh, most of these stories I can tell them to you because I've heard them so many times. Um, one of the things there is if, if you guys are interested, want to learn creative deals, get around creative investors. Because some of you guys are like, I was having trouble keeping up, right? When I first got around him, I'm like, I always take notes for future Courtney to understand because Court <laughs> her and Courtney doesn't understand <coughs> what he just said. But here's the thing is, I realized I wanted to do business like he does business, where people are calling me. Uh, I mean, like to have a tenant lend to you or a seller selling on seller financing call you and say, hey, I have $400,000 if it'll help you. You know, there's a level here that we have, he has this shirt as well. It says how you do real estate matters. And I hope you got that from him tonight. That how he does the deal, um, like how he treats people matters, but it's also how he structures the deals, right? That the safe financing, a lot of people do creative financing but they don't structure it with safe financing. You know, maybe they do it, hey, um, I'll, 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 I'll buy this house from you, but I'll pay it off in, a, in, in six months, you know, a balloon payment in six months or a year. A lot of that's not safe financing, right? Because then you're having to bet what's gonna happen in six months or in a year. Um, so one of the big things here, if that interests you, come talk to me. Because um, at this point, there's not a lot availability because it's next weekend but I can put you in contact with Rita, who puts on the event, and see if you can come. If you wanna hear, there's a handful of us who are gonna be there. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, next weekend in Biloxi, so it's actually on the coast, not too far from here. You can give them discounts. Yes. Give them some kind of discounts. Okay, so we <laughs> can do that. Um, come talk to us, but we're very much over time. Are there any dying questions to ask him before we close up shop here? One last question that I know I got a ton of that I skipped over. Your final brief thoughts on the market right now. It don't matter to me. It don't matter. Real estate is an imperfect market. I don't care how good things are. Or how bad. If you're in the stock market and you buy a Coca-Cola stock and you're in Tokyo or in New York City or Slidell, or where, where we're coming to, at the exact same time, you're gonna pay the same price. The real estate, there's always imperfections in the market. Don't generalize, oh, interest rates are up, I'm not gonna buy now, or man, interest rates are so low, you can't find a deal, nobody's gonna own or finance. Three years ago, I bought four places from people over 70, got 30 year financing at 3%, one of them one and a half percent. And the people are over 70 years old, right in the middle of those good good markets. There's there's reasons <clears throat> that people don't need cash or whatever. You know, I mean, it's just a lot of reasons. But there's divorces going on. People are in different frames of mind. People want different things. People's values are different. You know, so it doesn't matter if it's up market, down market, whatever. It, it gets a little more interesting and funner. And, Things do get a little tough, you know, but um, 
because there's more problems to solve, but there's still a lot of problems to solve even when things are going good. So, so when matter. the market started shifting, I gave him a call. And because I've never been through a down market, I said, Leon, what are you doing? The market's starting to shift. What are you doing different right now to kind of adjust? He said, Courtney, I'm not doing anything different because I've always been trying to buy nice houses and nice neighborhoods and get safe financing. So with that being said, um, Leon, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you so much for coming. And you guys enjoy the stories. <laughs> Um, we're going to give away two books. You want to this one out? Mm -hmm. No, no. Okay. Um, I, got, I got to figure out a question here. Uh, who knows what year he, raise your hand, what year he got started investing? 1971. 1971. Okay. Is that right? No, ma'am. Uh, 1975. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you pick. She, she just said it. Okay, we're gonna give it to you. Here you go. You wanna pick one? So it was 1975. Yeah, behind, I always hate behind, behind her. Oh, behind this her. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Get this guy. Oh. Oh, that's good. You know, Courtney's always saying um, that she likes to hang around and ask questions to all the gray haired people. I'm gonna buy some of that just for men. Uh, <laughs> she won't have it. She'll be confused about asking me. <laughs> Interest rate, raise your hand please. Did Leon say he would pay uh, to that one person? Joe. Okay, here we go. There's not another book to pick from. Um, I always have to pick questions to ask. Welcome. Guys, um, one of the one of the first lessons Leon taught me uh, when I first met him, he told me, Hey Courtney, I'm going to a seminar in two week uh, in two weeks. You should go with me. And so I was like, I booked a flight, a hotel and everything, went to Atlanta with you. Um, That's the first time you saw me. Yep, and he told me, Courtney, there's always two seminars. So before we land the plane, can you explain that? Um, yeah, there's the one the seminar, and then there's a seminar outside the seminar. People you go to lunch with, people you talk to. He said, stay at the hotel. Yeah, stay at the hotel, uh, hang out with people, talk to people. You know, I've learned as much doing that as I have inside the seminar sometimes. So with that being said, there's going to be the meeting after the meeting at Chimes. Um, I know a lot of us are going to want to hang out here and talk. Um, Leon, will you be going? Yeah. I'll you know, got a few minutes? Because yeah. he, lives, he lives an hour away, and so I don't want to hold him too much. Um, but we're going to have to sh uh, close up shop here. But um, we're going to head that way. So if you guys, I know some of you are going to head on home, but if you guys want to join us, it's Chimes right down the way. And um, we're going to go grab a, um, a table there. You can get some drinks, food, and ask you to take care of your own bill. And we're going to go talk shop a little bit more, okay? You guys are come welcome to join us at the meeting after the meeting. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, March, what was it, 14th, 13th? 14th. Yes. I don't even know why I said that. The next second Tuesday of next month. See you guys then. Thanks for coming, you guys.